kids welcome back to my channel for our second part of if you lived with the Iroquois <laughs> lesson um, I wouldn't suggest watching this if you haven't watched the first one I would go back and watch the first one but generally you can start here if you want um, we're starting on a new chapter we're talking about what the Iroquois would have ate so what kinds of food would you eat you'd eat lots of vegetables fruits and nuts and many different kinds of meat and fish. Women farmed the fields surrounding the village. Although each family had its own small piece of land, the women shared the work. Certain fields were set aside to raise crops for council meetings and festivals. Everyone helped with these as well. Corn, beans, and squash were the main vegetables. They were called the Three Sisters our supporters, and were planted together in small hills. Since corn was the main crop, some women had over 150 corn recipes. Bunches of braided corn were hung up to dry from, from longhouse rafters. Other corn was shelled and cooked. Women pounded kernels into flour. Hunters and travelers carried pouches of powdered corn mixed with maple syrup. Where did you get meat and fish? Hunters brought home deer, bear, beaver, rabbit, squirrel, wild turkey, and passenger pigeon. Some meat was dried and stored in clay pots or in pits lined with skin animal skins. The Iroquois didn't kill for sport. They needed to hunt in order to live. Nearly everything from the hunt was used. The meat was eaten, skins made into clothing and bedding, bones used for tools and utensils, sinews for string. <laughs> at certain times of the year, female animals were not hunted at all, for it was the, the season when they bore their young. That's a rule we still have around here today. There's specific times you can't um, hunt and kill female deer. Iroquois men and boys were skilled fishermen too. They would often they often fished at night. The light from their torches would attract fish to the surface where the men could catch them easily. <laughs> there they are with all the corns and then there they are fishing. I fished at night when I was a kid. How many ways would you use corn? So many different things were done with corn. It's hard to count them all. For example, Dried kernels were used as beads and for decoration. Corn husks were made or used to make mats to sit on and sleep on. Moccasins, kindling, baskets, medicine masks, and dolls were all made out of the husks. Corn stalks were used as tubes to hold medicines. Green corn leaves were used as bandages. Corn silk was used to make medicines. Corn cobs were thrown on a fire for smoking skins. And that's not even counting all the ways corn was cooked. Would you eat meals with your family? You would eat a morning meal like breakfast together. After that, you were on your own. Your mother would have a pot cooking all day long. Whenever you were hungry, you could get something to eat. The Iroquois were known for their hospitality to neighbors and strangers alike. Wherever people came to the longhouse, they were offered, I'm sorry, whenever people came to the longhouse, they were offered something to eat. It was rude not to offer food to a visitor, and it was rude to refuse even if you were full. So if you visited five families in one morning, you ate at least a little at each place. You never saw a person starving or begging for food in an Iroquois village. So long as some people had food, no one was ever allowed to go hungry. Don't you wish the world still operated like that? They were good people. That concept was strong in my family as well. You always offered what you had, and it was rude to refuse if somebody offered you, even if you weren't hungry. Did each family own the land it farmed? No. The Iroquois, like most Native Americans, did not believe you could own buy or sell land. The earth was a gift from the Creator to be passed on to your children. Sometimes the Iroquois spoke of caring for the earth to the seventh generation, which means as far into the future as you can imagine. 
which really means forever. Women who worked the land temporarily controlled it, but never permanently owned it. The Iroquois didn't measure people's worth by how much property or land they had. In fact, chiefs were usually among the poorest in the village. They were judged by how wise and generous they were. When chiefs received gifts, they were expected to give them away. This was very different from the way of the colonists and how they thought about land and property. In Europe, the wealthier you were, the more powerful you were. And so when the colonists met the people of the five nations, there was often misunderstandings and conflicts about land and property. What kind of clothing would you wear? Everybody's clothing was handmade. You'd wear deer skins that the women had tanned, cut, and sewed. Like other Native Americans, the Iroquois used what nature provided and fashioned it for their needs. Women wore long skirts that reached almost to their ankles. The skirts were decorated with beads or porcupine quills dyed red, blue, and yellow. Sometimes women wore leggings under their skirts. On top, they wore a deerskin vest or blouse. Men wore kilt-like skirts, almost to their knees, over leggings. They, too, wore blouses or vests made of decorated deerskins. They took great care in the decoration of their clothes, but it was mostly about essential priority and not, like, I need to have the best of the best. How would you prepare skins for clothing? Before skins could be made into clothing, they needed to be tanned. Tanning was the most interesting process. You'd use not only the skin of the deer, but also its brains. The women mixed the brains with moss and formed cakes that they dried. These cakes would last for years. To tan a skin, a woman first scrapped off the hair scraped off the hair scrapped <laughs> then she boiled the brain cake in water removed the moss and soaked the skin in the solution for a few hours she wrung the skin out and stretched it until it was dry and soft if the skin was thick she would repeat the process until it was ready for the next step at this point the pores of the deer skin were still open and the skin could tear easily. So the women smoked each side of the skin over a corn cob fire until the pores closed. Then the skins were ready to be cut and stitched into clothing. Seems like a long process and a tedious one. There they are making clothes. What kinds of shoes would you wear? Everyone wore moccasins, which were strong, comfortable, and often decorated with special designs. They were made of one piece of deer skin that had a seam at the heel and in front above your foot. There was never a seam on the bottom for it would have been uncomfortable. The moccasin was sewed together with a deer bone needle using sinew from the deer or thread. What shoes were good in winter? In the winter, you would use a special kind of shoe with your fur-lined moccasins, a snowshoe. Snowshoes were an Indian's invention. They were nearly free, three feet long and about 16 inches wide. They were made from pieces of hickory wood bent around at the top. The netting was made of deer leather. Snowshoes were particular, particularly useful on hunting trips. A moose or deer would move slowly as it sank through the snow crust, while the hunter in snowshoes walked quickly on the surface. Snowshoeing is a very big sport around here today. Here's the moccasin. Here's the snowshoe. It's like basically hiking in winter. We put on the snowshoes and we go through the snow. <laughs> How would you wear your hair? Women and girls wore their hair in two braids until they were married. When then they would usually wear one braid and tie it up with a ribbon or ornament. Men and boys, ages 15 and up, often had only a strip of hair on top of their heads. Today, we call this a mohawk haircut. But in fact, men in many tribes in the eastern United States wore their hair this way. They didn't shave their heads. 
They pulled the hairs out. Ouch. Men and boys also plucked their facial hair. As the hair on the chin and above the upper lip began to grow, they would pull it out, sometimes with their fingers, sometimes using clamshells as tweezers. Beards and mustaches made you look too much like a furry animal, people said. And <laughs> that sounds painful. How were you punished if you did something wrong? If you did something bad, you were never spanked. Water might be thrown on you, or you might be dunked in a stream. If you were really bad, you knew Long Nose would come after you. He threatened to carry you off unless you promised to be good. Long Nose was an adult, usually a relative, who wore a special mask that every child knew and feared. When Long Nose came after you, you always promised to change your behavior. <laughs> oh my goodness. So they wore two braids until they were married. Then they were, the females wore one. The boys had mohawks, which all the little boys still love today. But instead of shaving their head, they would pull it out. That's crazy. There's the long nose. Oh, it never. I mean, I pluck my eyebrows, but I can deal with that. I couldn't deal with it on my scalp. Yikes. <laughs> how, are, how are grown ups punished for committing crimes? Not many people committed crimes, and so there were no jails or police. Hardly anyone ever stole anything. There were no locks on longhouse doors. A stick or a pole leaning across a door was a sign that no one was home and others should stay out. Inside the longhouse, all possessions were stored in open areas. Stealing, however, was so shameful, everyone looked down on a thief, and that was considered a very strong punishment. A few crimes would be severely punished. Murder, the worst crime of all, was punishable by death. When a murder occurred, the nation or clans involved held meetings to try to prevent revenge attacks. The murderer's family might send a present of white wampum to the victim's family. This was a sign of a confession and asking for forgiveness. If the wampum was accepted, the murderer was forgiven. If it wasn't accepted, the victim's family had a right to punish the murderer. Would you go to a doctor when you got sick? There were different kinds of healers who could treat you. It all depended on your illness. The Iroquois believed you could become ill from bad food or water or air or by catching someone else's disease. But they also believed you could become sick because of witchcraft by bad people or by the, or by the work of evil spirits. Sometimes when you were sick, the false faces or one of the other medicine societies would try to heal you. These medicine groups perform special rituals that are still an important part of the religion. The Iroquois believe other people should not know about these ceremonies. You never paid the healers. Instead, you offered them sacred tobacco and gave them the kinds of food they liked. The false faces favored a certain kind of pudding. Another medicine group, the Little Water Society, loved boiled bear's head and corn syrup. If you were cursed, you became a member of the society and helped to treat others. I'm sorry, if you were cured, not cursed, you became a member of the society and helped to treat others. If you broke your leg or arm, you'd be treated by a surgeon. The Jesuit priests who traveled among the Iroquois in the 1600s wrote in their diaries that the Iroquois were excellent surgeons who not only set broken bones, but also understood the importance of keeping wounds clean. Not many European doctors practiced strict cleanliness in those days. Pictures on it. If you had a cold, fever, chills, snake, snake bite, or some similar sickness, an herbalist would properly treat you. The herbalist was usually an older woman who knew which plants could be used for healing. Certain roots, for example, cured rattlesnake bites, and very strong tea made of maple bark would help you if you had a stomach ache. You could also soak maple leaves in hot water and use them like a heating pad to get rid of a boil. The knowledge about plants were handed down from grandmothers to mothers to their daughters and on and on. 
Many of our medicines today are made from plants. That's one reason some people are working so hard to save the rainforest, for many medical plants grow there. Research in laboratories, researchers in laboratories, make other medicines, often copying the way plants work. There are scientists and others who are trying to find Native Americans who still have the ancient medicine plant knowledge. They believe there is much we can learn from the old ways that can help us today. There they are setting a boom. They were very good healers. Very, very good. How did you know the time or date if you didn't have a clock or a calendar? The Iroquois didn't measure time the way we do today. They marked the passage of time by the rising and setting of the sun and the changes in the moon. It takes about a month for a new moon to reach its first quarter, become full, and finish its last quarter. The Iroquois had different names for the moon at different times of the year, depending on what was happening in nature. We don't know how the very old name, or we don't know the very old names, but these are some Mohawk names we do know. The April, May moon is Honor Kakoka or Promise of Nature. Sorry if I said that wrong. The September October moon is Saskikoa. <laughs> Last warning of the harvest. And December January moon is Tashotara. Starting to freeze. <laughs> People didn't need calendars, for example, to know when the midwinter festival would begin. When they were away from home, hunters watched for a group of seven stars that we call Placides. These are winter stars that only appear in the eastern sky after the first frost. Pleiades, sorry. Why can't I read? Set in the west around the time of the last frost. When they are directly overhead, the time of frost is half over. That was the sign that the midwinter festival would occur five days after the next new moon. And so the Iroquois didn't need clocks or calendars. They carefully watched the sun, moon, stars, and earth. And they lived their daily lives in unison with the world as it changed around them. A lot of people back then paid attention to the stars to tell months and phrases of the year, seasons. Would you go to school? You wouldn't go to a school building. In fact, you wouldn't go to any formal school. You learn by watching grown-ups hunt and farm, tan hides and carve bowls, make bowls, arrows, and beaded moccasins, and create and build all other things. You learned about Iroquois history and the founding of the Great League when elders told the story of the peacemaker and Hiawatha at the festival. This was not the same Hiawatha in the Longfellow poem, The Song of Hiawatha, by the way. During the long winter months, children sat around the fire and listened as their elders told fabulous, fabulous tales. Fabulous tales. I think they're missing a letter in there. There were tales about good people and very foolish ones. Some of the stories were funny, some were sad, some were very scary. All had a meaning you could think about. Who were your teachers? Until boys were eight or nine years old, they stayed with their mothers, sisters, and aunts. When they grew older, they spent some time with their fathers. But often, their most important teachers were their mother's brothers, their uncles. From these older men, boys learned the ways of the forest, how to hunt, make tools, build longhouses and canoes. Girls learned many things from their mothers and aunts, how to make clothing, cultivate the soil, plant seeds, and bring in the harvest. You also learn from your own experiences. As teenagers, both boys and girls went into the forest alone. You stayed in a small hut and you didn't eat any food for days. If you had a vision or a special dream, what you dreamed about became your guardian spirit, a spirit you believed would protect and watch over your life. A little freaky. <laughs> there they are learning. Learning from uncles and the aunts. What kind
kind of work did people do? Nobody ever asked the question, what do you want to do when you grow up? <laughs> you knew what you were going to do. Work was part of everyday life. Unlike today, when a person's job may be just one part of a whole process, with the Iroquois, you usually did everything. For example, if you work today in a basket making factory, you might do only one thing, such as prepare the base. But an Iroquois girl or woman would do the whole job. She made the tools she needed for the work. She gathered and prepared the materials, and then she actually made the whole basket. There was no such thing as a job people looked down on. Every job was respected. Work also depended on the season. In the spring, you would peel elm bark for longhouses and canoes, tap trees for maple syrup, pick strawberries when they ripened, and catch fish. When the ground was ready for planting, you'd sow seeds for all the vegetables. In the late summer and fall, you'd harvest the crops and prepare them for storage. In the fall, you'd begin hunting and continue through part of the winter. During the winter, you'd spend a good deal of time indoors, making and repairing clothing, tools, bowls, baskets, and instruments of all kind. So every season had a job. <laughs> Girls and women and boys and men often did different kinds of work. Men made tools for hunting and weapons for, for war. They made wampum and carved wooden bowls, cups, and stone pipes. They also made sports equipment and musical instruments. Women made clay pots and baskets, cradle boards for carrying babies, clothing and moccasins, which sometimes had elaborate decorations and many other things. Although women and men often worked on different things, there was also a great deal of cooperation. For instance, men cleared the farmland while women were the actual farmers. When men hunted, they used woven straps women had made to carry home their game. And when women had made baskets, men crafted the handles. Work was something everybody did. You didn't work for money and you didn't work for someone else. You worked and made things for yourself and your community. In fact, you just you made just about everything in life you needed and used. What games would you play? Everyone loves sports and games. There are many team games. One of the most popular was lacrosse, still very popular around here, which is called the ball game. At festivals and other celebrations, sometimes one village or one clan challenged another. Each even nations played against one another. Players often trained and ate special diets to prefer, prepare for big games. There were usually six to eight players on a team. They lined up in two rows facing each other. Each player had a bat. The ball was dropped between the two lines and each team fought for possession. You would run with the ball in the bat's netting until you were blocked. Then you'd hurl the ball to another team player. If you carried the ball through your own team's gate a set number of times, your team would win. As with all Iroquois team games, individual players weren't thought of as stars. It was the team's victory that was important. During everyday life, runners carried information from one village or nation to another. So it's not surprising that running was also a sport. Trained runners often competed at festivals. Sometimes a race would be the entertainment, ending one of the Grand Council meetings. Would you play games of chance? The Iroquois loved these, game, these kinds of games. They would often bet on the outcome of any contest. One favorite was a game played with beans made of polished elk horn. They were about an inch in diameter and burned on one side to make them dark colored. You'd put eight in a bowl and toss them. If six turned up the same color, you got two points. Less than six, no points. Seven, four points. All the same color, 20 points. There was a pile of extra beans on the side. The winner received a bean for each point. A similar game was played with six peach stones blackened on one side and shaken in a bowl. 
The peach stone game was often played on the last day of the green corn harvest and New Year's festival. So it's kind of like dice where they are running. There's their bead game. <laughs> were there special wintertime games? In winter, snow, snow snake was probably the most popular game. You played with five to nine foot long polished hickory stick. That was the snake. The head was about an inch wide, rounded, and turned up slightly. The back end tapered down to about half an inch, kind of like hockey stick. You prepared a track by dragging a log for about a third of a mile through the snow. Then you'd sprinkle water on the track to make it icy. You held the snake in your right hand and supported it with your left hand. You'd run a few steps and hurl it down the track. The hard part was to throw it in an absolutely straight line so that it wouldn't get stuck in a snowbank. Whichever team threw the snake the furthest for a set number of times won. What were the traditional religious beliefs? The Iroquois believed the Creator, or Great Spirit, made the world. They have a creation story, much like Judo, Christian, Garden, or Eden story. They also believed that almost all natural things were under the care of spirits. There were spirits of the wind, clouds, rain, trees, plants, medicines, and more. These spirits were not worshipped as gods. They were assistants to the Great Spirit. With the spirit world all around, religion was a part of everything in life. The Iroquois had no special religious leaders like priests, ministers, or rabbis, but each na nation had keepers of the faith in charge of religious festivals. When you had that duty, your name was changed and you received a new one. Keepers of the faith were ordinarily men and women with no special privileges, costumes, or rewards, but they did have special responsibilities. They organize the festivals and perform some of the rituals. There they are playing snow steak. <laughs> Religious ceremonies could last for hours. Some festivals lasted for days. There was always an offering of thanks to the Creator and all of nature. This is one part of the Thanksgiving address called Greetings to the Natural World that has been published in a booklet. We are all thankful to our mother, the earth, for she gives us all that we need for life. She supports our feet as we walk upon her. It gives us joy that she continues to care for us as she has from the beginning of time. To our mother, we send greetings and thanks. Now our minds are one. That was a real prayer that I used to say. Of course, not in English. <laughs> Did everyone practice the same religion? Most people shared the same religious beliefs, but let's say you had been captured and adopted by an Iroquois family. If your original home, you had practiced a different religion, you could continue to do so. The Iroquois respected others' religions. They did not try to force their beliefs on anyone. In fact, their constitution, the great law of peace, guaranteed freedom of religion. I feel like I've adopted their, their sense of rules. How did the Iroquois believe the world began? In the Iroquois story, like the biblical story of creation, earth was made before they were, there were people. The creation story has been told for centuries. Today, there are at least 40 versions. Although there are small differences, they all tell the same basic story. It's a cute little nature. <laughs> Before people lived on earth, before there was even an earth, there was a sky world. Below the sky world was a vast space of air, and below that, a great body of water. Sky people lived in the upper world, in the center of the sky. In the center of the sky world stood a magnificent tree whose flowers gave out brilliant light. One day, the chief of the sky people became ill. To help him get well, the great tree was pulled up. The chief's wife bent over to look through the hole and fell into the vast space. When the seabirds below saw her falling, they caught her on their wings and gently lowered her down. 
The turtle offered to hold her, but first, earth was needed to cover his back. The otter, beaver, and muskrat, each in turn, swam to the bottom of the great water to gather soil. Only the muskrat succeeded. He placed a fistful of dirt on the back of the turtle, and it grew into the island of earth. The birds then lowered Sky Woman onto the turtle's back. In time, Sky Woman gave birth to a daughter, who gave birth to twin sons. The first son was born in the normal way. He was called Sapling, sometimes known as Good or Straight Mind. The second son, impatient to be born, pushed out through his mother's side, and she died. He was called Flint, sometimes known as Bad or Crooked Mind. When the twins buried their mother, the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, grew from her head, sacred tobacco grew from her heart. Sapling created people and all the good things of the world. For every good thing Sapling made, his brother Flint created troubling things. When Sapling made deer, Flint made mountain lions that killed deer. When Sapling made straight flowing rivers, Flint created rapids and great boulders to block the flow. That when sapling created trees, Flint made thorny bushes. In the end, the Iroquois believed the world was balanced, for there is the possibility of good and bad in everything and everybody. So that's how they believed the world was created. <laughs> I hope you liked part two. Part three. It's going to be, uh, you want to just finish it now? Let's do it. What were their special holiday festivals? Yes, and they were held throughout the year. I'm sorry, were there special holiday festivals? Yes, and they were held throughout the year. The first of the six main holidays was the Maple Festival in early spring, when the sap began to flow. Everyone gave thanks to the Great Spirit for the return of spring and to the maple tree for giving its sweet waters. Like all the festivals, there were day-long ceremonies of speeches, prayer, music, dances, games, and always a feast. At this particular feast, as you might imagine, you'd have maple syrup and maple candies. At all the festivals, sacred tobacco was burned. The rising smoke carried messages of thanks to the Creator. For some ceremonies, tobacco was thrown on the fire. Sometimes it was smoked, but it was not smoked every day the way some people do today. Tobacco was a sacred plant and was used only for religious purposes. The planting festival occurred later in the spring. You gave thanks to the Great Spirit for the return of the planting season and you'd ask for blessings on the seeds placed in the earth. In late May and early June, tiny wild strawberries ripened. With them came the Strawberry Festival, which celebrated the return of the first fruits of the earth. After the long winter, it was a sweet beginning to a new year. You'd feast on fresh strawberries. Yum! Strawberries still grow prominently through here, and they are still a much favored fruit. The next festival was a very big one that lasted four days. It was the Green Corn Festival and it was usually held in August when corn, squash, and beans were ready to eat. Everyone gave thanks to the spirits governing the three sisters. During the Green Corn Festival, all children born since the Midwinter Festival would be given their names. On each day, there were speeches and thanksgiving and the Thanksgiving address, prayers, dances, songs, and other rituals. You feasted on corn syrup and succotash, which, <laughs> which is made of corn, beans, and squash. On the last day of the festival, everyone played the peach stone game. The harvest festival was usually celebrated in early October. All the crops were picked, cooked, and stored for winter eating. Like the Green Corn Festival, it lasted for four days of prayers, songs, dances, games, and feasts. The Midwinter or New Year's Festival, usually in early February, was the longest. It lasted seven days. The festival began when two elders visited every house in the village to announce the new year. 
They dressed in bearskins or buffalo robes and had wreaths of corn husks on their heads and around their ankles and arms. In each long horse, long house, they stirred the ashes of the old fire and told the people to clean house and light a new fire. I probably took a long time to visit each house. The Thanksgiving address lasted for hours. Then came the dream telling ceremony, for the Iroquois dreams had great meaning. You described your dream in a disguised way, sometimes in riddles, and then others had to guess its meaning. For example, someone might say, it has holes, yet it catches. This could mean a lacrosse stick, which has a net. <laughs> you would only be at peace when the meaning of your dream was guessed. It was as if by understanding your dreams, you were cleaning your mind and heart, just as you clean the longhouse for the new year. There was much dancing, singing, and feasting, and all the babies born since the Green Corn Festival were named. When was the League of Iroquois founded? The story of the beginning of the League has been told over hundreds of years, so far back in the past that no one is certain of the date. Some believe the League was founded in the 1400s, others say earlier. Still, others think later, in the 1600s. Jesuit missionaries who traveled along the Iroquois believe that the League was very ancient. How did the League begin? Before the League existed, the five nations were always at war with one another. Village fought village, and nation fought nation. It was called the time of great sour, <laughs> sorrow and terror. During these dark times, a man came down from the north to the Iroquois lands. His name was Deganawida. Deganawida? I'm sorry, I'm saying these wrong. <laughs> and he was adopted by the Mohawk. Today his name is never spoken, and he is known only as the Peacemaker. The Peacemaker brought the good news of peace and power, saying that only by ending war among themselves would the nations become strong. Only through union would the people be safe. The first person who accepted his message of peace was a woman named Jiganasasi. New face, it means. He called her the mother of nations. Then the peacemaker met Hiawatha and Onondaga by birth. The three set out to persuade the nations to join together in peace. The Onondaga were the hardest to convince. I live in Onondaga County. <laughs> Tadodaho, also called Atotarho, was the most powerful Onondaga chief. He was a very cruel and dangerous man, whose hair, it was said, twisted around his head like snakes. At first, Tadodaho <laughs> opposed the idea. Hiawatha, the story goes, finally persuaded him to join and thus combined the snakes out of, oh lord, Tado de Hajo's hair. <laughs> These names are hard. The people then uprooted the tallest pine tree and threw all their weapons of war into the hole. When they replanted this great tree of peace, four white roots spread out to the east, north, west, and south. The chief Chiefs of the nation sat under the tree and met in council. In the village, the peacemakers said, many families lived together in a longhouse, each with a separate fire. Now, the five nations live in a great longhouse, each keeping its own fire. The nations remained separate. But living in peace under one roof, under one system of law, and also the Iroquois called themselves the Haudenosaunee, the people of the Longhouse. I'm sure I'm saying those wrong. I'm really sorry to the natives out there that are watching this. I didn't learn these names. I'm sorry. The peacemaker said if any people want to obey the laws of the great peace, they may trace the route to their source, and they shall be welcome to take shelter beneath the tree. In time, some 60 tribes came under Iroquois protection. What is the great law of peace? 
The great law of peace is the Iroquois Constitution. Like the United States Constitution, it establishes the form of the government and sets down rules about the freedoms and duties of the people and their leaders. Like the British Constitution, it is unwritten. The peacemaker believed that by joining the League of Five Nations could live in peace together. It worked once the Iroquois formed the League. They never again fought against one another. There are some of the, here are some of the ideas of the Great Law. All Iroquois land was open to members of the Five Nations. It was safe to travel and hunt anywhere from Mohawk lands in, in the east to Seneca lands in the west. Women as well as men participated fully in government. Women had very important task of appointing the chiefs and removing them if they didn't properly perform their jobs. There they are, sitting in peace, talking things out. Freedom of religion was guaranteed to all, including other nations or individuals who joined the League. There was no such thing as slavery. If you were taken prisoner by the Iroquois, you were either adopted or killed. If you were adopted, you had all the freedoms everyone else had. Just as the United States flag is a symbol of American Union, the Longhouse and the Great Pine Tree with its white roots are the symbol of the Iroquois League. The peacemaker took one arrow from each of the five nations and tied them together. You can break one arrow, he said, but the bundle of five is too strong to destroy. The Iroquois League is, in fact, one of the world's longest lasting unions. The Great League continues to exist today in the United States and Canada. How was the government set up? The Iroquois government was like the American government today. Each of the five nations, like every American state, had its own government. Each nation sent chiefs to the League Council meetings just as each state sends representatives to the United States Congress. Like the American government, military leaders were not allowed to be regular or civilian leaders, and so council chiefs could not be warriors. Anything that concerned all the nations were discussed at the League Council meetings. The council met at least once a year. No one chief and no one nation ruled over the others. A league meeting was held across the council fire. On the east side of the fire sat the Mohawk and the Seneca, the elder brothers. The Oneida and Cayuga, the younger brothers, sat across from them on the west side. At the north were the Onondaga, the keepers of the council fire. They presided over the meetings. Everyone had to agree on all decisions, that is, all vo votes had to be unanimous. First, the chiefs of each nation talked among themselves and came to a decision. Then, each nation discussed the decision with the other nation on their side of the fire. When the Mohawk and Seneca were in agreement, they sent their decision across the fire to the Cayuga and Oneida. When all four agreed, the decision was told to the Onondaga. If the Onondaga agreed, the chief conducting the meeting announced that the League could now speak with one voice. They had come to a unanimous decision. If the Onondaga disagreed, the two sides across the fire discussed everything again. They might change their decision, but if they didn't, this time the Onondaga had to accept it. Only when everyone agreed did the League speak with one voice. Oh my gosh, Congress should act like this. We get so much more debt. <laughs> Were there special rules or behavior at the council meeting? When a person spoke, no one interrupted with questions. In fact, you never asked questions. You made all your comments when it was your turn to speak. Speakers held wampum strings in their hands. They used the wampum to help them remember everything they wanted to say. When they were finished, they hung the strings on a pole. The next speaker then picked them up. 
Whenever a new topic was raised, you waited a full day before discussing it. That way, everyone had a chance to think about it. You also ended the discussion at nightfall. If you stayed up late debating, you might lose your temper or rush into a decision because you were tired. The meetings took time and patient, patience, but they created a very strong union. Since the talks only ended when everybody agreed, everyone felt they had played an important part. All the people were encouraged to come to council meetings, not just the chiefs, and so a meeting was a great social event as well as time for government business. Who were the members of the League Council? When the Peacemaker and Hiawatha founded the League, there were 51 chiefs on the council, including the Peacemaker. The original chiefs' names because the names of the, became the names of the office. And so, if you became a council chief, you took the name of the chief you were replacing. Because the Peacemaker's name was never used again, after the first meeting, there were 50 chiefs. In addition to the council, regular council members, there were also pine tree chiefs. They were chosen by the council to be members because they were very smart. They were allowed to speak at meetings, but they did not vote. How did you become a, a council chief? A woman was the first person to accept the peacemaker's message, and so the peacemaker said women were to appoint the chiefs. The names of the council's chiefs belong to certain clans. The head woman of the clan consulted with the clan women and made the selection. Chiefs were appointed to the council for life. But if they became ill or didn't perform their job properly, the clan mother could remove them from office. She'd warn the chief several times. If he didn't change his behavior after the third warning, he was removed from office. When a chief died, a condolence ceremony was held to mourn his death and pass on the chief title to a new person. The Iroquois government was very different from European governments. Chiefs were not like kings. It was their job to serve the people, not to rule them. Chiefs were respected because of their wisdom, not because they were all-powerful. Often the colonists didn't understand this and believed that chiefs had more power than they really did. What was the condolence ceremony? This was a special, a special ritual performed when someone died. A village held the ceremony after the death of one of its people. The peacemaker, the story is told, used wampum to comfort Hiawatha, whose family had all died. The beads, said the pe peacemaker, became words that carry away the sadness. In a village, clans were divided into two groups for the ceremony. One group helped a family whose relative had died to grieve. The other offered comfort. It was said the comforters wiped away tears and cleaned the ears and throats of the mourners so they could begin to live normal lives again. When a council chief died, the whole league held the condolence ceremony. The two groups were the elder brothers, the Onondaga, joined the Mohawk and Seneca, and the younger brothers, the Oneida and Cayuga, they too helped with mourning and comforting. But the ceremony was much more elaborate. The dead chief's nation sent out runners to announce the ceremony. All the league chiefs and many people from their nations arrived at the scheduled time. Like other ceremonies, there was a set order for the events. First, everyone mourned the death of the old chief. Then they raised up a new chief to take his place. People sang songs and delivered thanksgiving prayers and speeches. Trained speakers recited the great law of peace. The names of all the council chiefs were repeated, since these were the names of the original 50 chiefs. It was a way of saying that the league was strong and long-lasting. It had continued from the past into the present and would go on into the future. Was there a special way the Iroquois ended their stories? Storytellers and orators had a very large collection of stories to choose from. The creation story, the story of the founding of the League, hundreds of fables, and many others. Whatever 
the tale, the speaker always ended by saying, Naho, it is finished. Naho. That's the end of our lesson. <laughs> I think. Yep. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot about the Iroquois and the natives in my area. Uh, I adore them. They're a big part of our culture. It's very, their influence affected our government and how we live um, and what we eat. So I hope you learned a lot and I'll see you next time. Kids, be good out there, okay?